Belfast. Uh, I work for a company called Proofpoint, who are a cybersecurity company. Uh, and in my spare time, uh, I'm a contributor to OpenFAS, and I have been for the last two plus years, uh, and seen, have seen the project sort of grow and sort of morph beyond what it was uh, massively over the last two plus years. So start with the obligatory serverless. This is where your serverless runs in this data center, uh, if only that were actually the case. Um, what we've actually seen, and you've seen this repeated again and again today, we've seen an evolution from or monoliths to microservices and at this point in time to functions. And what you've seen over time is you've seen an increased sort of utilization of resources, whether that be being able to pack more on individual systems or whether you're kind of able to sort of utilize sort of per request billing systems and the, the, the pricing models have kind of changed over the years. And you've seen a, a decoupling from infrastructure. Back in the monolith days, you cared about everything. You cared about the motherboard that was in your Solaris machine because it might have a slightly different chip to another sort of server that you had in your data center. Microservices, you cared a little bit less, but you still cared about the operating system. You cared about everything that was on it. And where functions, we've kind of moved to the point where, as you would if you were writing code, you've decoupled and decomposed your business logic to its smallest, most discrete uh, component. Um, so in terms of sort of increased resource utilization, anybody who's been around for a while and remembers monoliths know that this is what your expenditure would look like as your service grew. You had to have a big massive outlay of cost at the beginning until you started sort of increasing your customers and then you had to just double it up again because you always had to sort of over capacity. Um, but, with the, but with the billing models that we're seeing in serverless, you can track your usage far more linearly. You only pay for what you use, whether that increases at night or decreases during the day, uh, what have you. So what are the functions then? So functions are short-lived. They generally aren't sort of uh, services that you run for extended period, although short-lived is very subjective. We'll talk about that later. Uh, no ports. You're not actually you're not running a service. Uh, no state, uh, and they tend to be single purpose. You know, you want to have a function that is as sort of deconstructed and decomposed as possible. So, Brendan Gurns last year talked about the future of Kubernetes being serverless. Um, and this is kind of when we were in the, the white hot heat of everything is going to be serverless, serverless is going to eat everything. Sort of reading between the lines, kind of, I think what he was actually talking about was we were moving to a world where things were more distributed, where we were starting to see things being more decoupled. We were kind of learning how to break sort of our, our software apart, where the focus was moving back towards developers. You know, your job is to let a developer develop the business logic and get it to production, and anything between that, those two points, is an unnecessary cost most of the time. It's a tax you're paying to get your business logic into production and increased you know, efficient uh, resource utilization. So he's talking there about, you know, if you back in the day we were using Heroku, you wanted to run a service, you were paying for that whether it was being hit or not. Uh, um, and now you're paying per request. So the, we're, we're, the billing models have changed drastically. So we've seen all this before. It's, it's reminiscent of a clean architecture. It's what you would build if you were to set out and build something really clean and really nice. But what, it, what is serverless? Is it, it's more than that. I like to think of it as a new color. So this is, I'm going to mispronounce the name, but Van Gogh, uh, one of his paintings that was produced after the discovery of Prussian blue in the 1700s. This is a color that never existed before, so everybody painted blue everything. So this is where we were for the last year or two. Serverless is going to do everything. It's not quite that. It's a new color. It's a new palette. It doesn't mean that every piece of art that went before is invalid. It doesn't mean that every piece of art that comes after it necessarily has to just be blue. It just lets you make things that you couldn't make before. So the OpenFAS project, um, the core focus of the, the project is that we, we like to sort of think about developers first. We're developers building it. We're building it for developers, and we want it to be sort of as usable and as low, uh, low barrier to entry as possible. We also want to build something that's operationally simple because people have to run it and operate it and maintain it. So we want to build something that is just simple and clean to run. 
uh, and we want to sort of focus on the community. You know, the more, we, the more people we have contributing and getting involved, the richer the ecosystem becomes. So it started in November 2016. Uh, it was DockerCon, did a competition to see who could extend the use of Docker. So uh, the founder, Alex Alex, took Docker Swarm and replicated a, 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 a Lambda-type environment and was able to sort of write uh, sort of functions for Alexa using Docker. Um, since then, we've, a num we've quite a few production users. We have a number of banks and businesses in the, the financial sector, people in the data science sector, and so on. And, and that, uh, that list keeps growing. Uh, and the last two years in a row, we won a Bossy Award for Best Open Source Cloud Computing uh, Project. So you need to be tribal. You need to be able to get up and running fast. So if you're going to deploy on Kubernetes, we provide Helm charts, so you just add the repo and you install the chart, and we've like different options depending on where you're you're deploying it. So, and it's not just you know Kubernetes isn't a monolith. Um, you have multiple Kubernetes or Kubernetes, whatever so whatever the plural is. So we work on like pretty much well, all of the hosted environments. You know, through the sort of your developers running Minikube or MicroKates or Edge devices running K3S or people running Rancher, you know, we just work sort of on those platforms. We also work on Docker Swarm. So if you're ready, if you're in an organization and you have Swarm, that's fine. You can still write your functions exactly as you would for Kubernetes, and it just works. So the way we do that is we have a, a sort of a pretty composable architecture. We have UI, CLI, and a REST interface to the gateway, which sort of handles sort of um, access to functions and so on. Uh, we have Prometheus for metrics and alert manager hooked into that for auto scaling. We use NATS for uh, asynchronous messaging. Uh, and then we have a plug this provider mechanism in the background where you plug in whichever system you're going to sort of work with. So whether that's Kubernetes or Swarm or Nomad, uh, you know, pretty much anything can be plugged in. And we try to be mechanically sympathetic with whatever we're using under a hood. It's very important not to bend things to look like you want the world to look like. You need to work in a way that the underlying platform works. And one of the benefits of that is you get to do things that you may not have been able to do otherwise. So our, open, our, our Kubernetes uh, provider uh, is implemented as a CRD. So it's a custom Kubernetes custom resource definition, which is basically it's a, it's a Kubernetes native model of open fast functions and primitives. Um, and completely sort of configurable and manageable natively within, within Kubernetes, which manages the state, the life cycle, everything. It doesn't know that there's anything there. It just sees a native object. And the benefits that you get from that are you get to leverage all Kubernetes tooling. So if, if you have a tool that works with Kubernetes and you're running OpenFAS, suddenly you're able to bubble up all that functionality as well. So this was implemented. This was created originally by a guy from WeaveWorks, guy Stefan Prodan, one of the community members. Um, so like, you can start working with functions just using Cube Control. They're just native Kubernetes objects. You also then get to leverage things like Istio, Service Mesh. It just works, you know, with with the platform. So there you're getting observability and policy-driven security and everything. It just works because you've been mechanically sympathetic with the platform. So we swarm providers, nomad providers, rancher providers. We have AWS Fargate providers. So there's a contributor, Ed Wild, who's like a platform architect for a fintech company in the UK, Form 3. And he's built a Fargate provider where you're just running all of your containers in the background on AWS Fargate. So you're only paying for things while they're running. He's actually in the process of taking it a little bit further. And he's got a Lambda provider where you just deploy your open fast function and it transforms it into some, into a lambda function so you just it just works in lambda and it's the same function primitive that you've had running in all these other providers which just works and then literally about 3 hours ago um, sort of the founder of the project has pushed out you can now run your open fast functions on Google Cloud Run which was Google announced a, a couple of hours ago well last night so simple UI out of the box. You know, we just want to be clean, simple, minimal. People will build richer integrations for themselves if they need. Uh, we have a, a store for making available common functions. You can just one click get, get your functions up and running. 
um, and then you can manage it, check sort of invocations and so on. There's also full Prometheus metrics, so you can get a far deeper view of what's going on uh, built into the system. Uh, we expose a rich REST API that you can leverage yourself as well, and a CLI. So the, the part of this is that we want to just, we want to come to the end user. We don't want to have people sort of, you know, shift their mental model and, and sort of start thinking about things in the open OpenFAS way. We want to, as much as possible, go to meet them and go to meet them in their workflows uh, as much as possible. So the CLI works on you know, pretty much any operating system, any architecture. Um, so how do you then create a function? We've, we can bootstrap one through the CLI. Uh, we provide a whole range of uh, templates. So there's a, a core set of community maintained tablets, templates, but people have then written them for like everything, or PowerShell, you name it, any sort of language that you sort of, you've ever heard of. You either either is a template, or somebody has written a template, or somebody, or you could write a template. Uh, so creating a function, we have this faz new. So faz new, you specify what language you want. So I want a go function. Uh, the prefix is your, your. We use Docker Hub in this case to sort of distribute the function artifacts. That can be a private repo, uh, whatever you want, uh, and then we just call it hello world. So this will go ahead, pull down a template and create a, a small templated function. And we'll, we'll look at this uh, live as well, hopefully, if we have a bit of time later. Uh, in the goals case, all it's producing is a, a hello world.yaml, which is a definition of the function, uh, and a small handler. Uh, so you just implement your logic in the handler. If, you, if you're a PHP, it's got other extensions in there for like Composer, and, you know, JavaScript is like NPM sort of extent, you know, uh, the ability to plug in modules and so on. Um, and then the, the handlers themselves tend to be very simple. Um, it just, in this case, this particular um, implementation just reads a byte stream and returns. It's, 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 like a, it's like a POSIX utility, standard in, standard out. It just works. We also have an alternative implementation of the watchdog layer that, that uh, can also expose things uh, through uh, sort of REST. So then to deploy it and build it, we just have one command. So this actually wraps a build, a push, and a deploy command. We just provide like a, a helper called op. And what's this, what this is doing is it's building the function, creating the container, pushing the container to whatever sort of uh, repository that you want to use. And then it's deploying it to your OpenFAS instance, whether it be local running in Docker or it could be remote on a cloud provider. Uh, invoking them, you can then just, as you've seen before, you just curl the endpoint, or we provide an, an invoke command just to sort of yeah, make life easier for you. Um, and it's asynchronous out of the box. You don't actually have to do anything. The only difference with an asynchronous function is instead of function, a function name, you just async dash and you provide a callback header and your function is now asynchronous. So this, this is a lot of people who are running very sort of heavy sort of uh, work or functions. You know, so there's quite a few of the machine learning type sort of implement, uh, applications. Um, they like be, being able to sort of run things asynchronously because it can take quite a while for stuff to run. Uh, initially, a lot of people started using OpenFAS because the limits in Lambda, for example, were very small. I think it's up to 15 minutes now, but it used to be a lot smaller. But you, they have maybe functions that might run for you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes. It's whatever they need a function to be, and they can sort of do that with OpenFAS. So this is an example of somebody using machine learning. So this is Nita Kashivan, University of Washington. And uh, she was using it to sort of carry out sort of, sort of machine learning tasks and classification tasks for images, where she, I think she was uh, she was gamifying the detection of uh, sort of cancerous sort of regions in brain scans. And in the background, that's just getting sent off to OpenFAS functions. And she specifically liked the fact that she could run whatever, whatever memory she needed whatever sort of duration she needed, she could build a function to do that and, and take advantage of the underlying uh, compute capacity that she had available to her. Uh, uh, I don't know. It's feasible. I'm playing around with the Jetson Nano board at the minute to sort of look at some of the, the, <laughs> the Jetpack stuff. Um, so it's, it's, it's totally feasible. So you would run some stuff on like GKE or something and leverage that. Uh, Patricio is a senior analyst for Vision Banco. 
So uh, it's one of the, the sort of the bigger banks in Paraguay. And they've moved from a JBoss based sort of monolith and set of microservices. They're gradually pulling stuff out and running it in open files in production. So they're kind of decomposing their existing stack, breaking it up. So strangler pattern type approaches, things like, you know, you go onto a page and you want to have a loan calculation, a front end developer just develops a component. And instead of having to sort of integrate that into some, into some big back end, it's just a function that's dedicated to calculating that particular sort of uh, loan. They're also looking at uh, implementation uh, functions where you know scanning uh, checks and sort of automatically processing checks. So they're looking to sort of heavily utilize this, um, and they because they have a very large existing sort of uh, vSphere data center, and they wanted to sort of maximize the usage there while also positioning themselves to be able to go forward and sort of potentially move to to other platforms. So we've quite a few users. This list is out of date, but it's growing. Um, one of the things that we're also seeing is that you want to go to the developer, so a command line isn't enough. Developers work in Git. They work on pull requests and merges, and you want to be able to sort of meet them there so that the platform disappears into the background, the tooling disappears into the background. So we have our own GitOps platform called uh, OpenFast Cloud, which is just it's just a collection of open fast functions that run on open fast to build open fast functions that run on open fast. I think it's functions all the way down. Um, and we provide a, a hosted platform as well. We have a community run sort of open fast cloud that if you want to kind of run some functions in, in production or in, in uh, sort of uh, publicly, you can contact us and we'll bootstrap you on the platform, but you can just run it entirely yourself publicly or in your private sort of uh, networks. So the process there is you work in your workspace, you push to the repository, which triggers OpenFAS Cloud, which then goes through the whole uh, function building, packaging, deploy, with there's like rich notifications back to GitHub. So you get like statuses, you know, if it's building, if there's errors, you're not having to go and look at a different platform to try and find your errors the errors are just pushed back to you in your PR. So it means you just have one window, your GitHub, which is, which is really lovely. It's very, sim very similar in intent to what the guys at GitLab are doing. Um, so yeah, there's an example, you get like rich status back if you wish. You know, status what's going on. And we have a small sort of UI for it. Um, so functions, are useful on their own, but as people point out, it depends on sort of how you're triggering it. And this is where this is where cloud providers get very sticky. You know, you've like a an Azure specific um, message queue, or sort of an Amazon specific message queue. You've you've all these very vendor specific things that don't play very well together. So this is where the the cloud event spec is coming in. So it's very early days. It's a 0 0.2 spec. Um, and it's basically, it's a specification for describing event data in a common way. It aims to be a glue for events, which is what functions need to be truly portable, truly sort of, you know, plug and playable. Uh, and it aims for consistency. So any provider that implements this, you know how to handle an event from that provider. It aims to be accessible. You suddenly, because you're not trying to hit moving targets, you suddenly can build tooling for this sort of lingua franca. Uh, and portability. It means then that if you're building something that uses, is consuming services via cloud events, you can suddenly take that and move it and put it, put it somewhere else. So one of the first cloud providers to implement some sort of support for, um, for, for cloud events was Microsoft. So uh, I, I put together a demo last year where it just worked out of the box with, uh, with OpenFAS. You go to the website or jump on Slack, there's some of the guys who worked on that, and it's very simple to get up and running, and we'll help you dig into that further. So getting involved, we have a pretty big Slack community. Um, you kind of need a full-time person just to keep track of it now. It's a bit crazy. Uh, we also have a set of self-paced labs. So in addition to the documentation, we have like a, a lab that you can take yourself or you can give publicly. It's, we've had people give it all over the world, from like Japan to India to South America. Uh, 
and you're more than welcome to come take a look at that. It's a very nice guided introduction to the platform in a very kind of end result driven fashion. So you're looking at secrets and sort of SSL and all these sort of things. Uh, and we have a, a blog, so uh, if you want to take a, a screenshot of those or a picture of those, you can jump on. Um, I wouldn't be allowed to come unless I sort of uh, said that we're actually hiring. We're actually hiring for an engineer, a sales engineer in uh, in Holland at the minute. So if somebody wants to check out Proofpoint, we are always looking for good people. And uh, that's it.